Yeah. Okay, can, uh, can everybody hear me or can you hear me at least, Daniel? Yes, very well. Okay, perfect. So, uh, so indeed, my uh, title is The Nonlinear Stability of the Schwarzschild Metric Without Symmetry. Um, and the main result, which I'm going to talk about, is joint work with Gustav Holtzegel, Igor Rodnianski, and Martin Taylor. So, um, ah, okay, now I have to figure out whether I can actually control. Ah, okay, perfect. So let me immediately uh, tell you the, the plan of this lecture. So I'll first, as, as quickly as possible, uh, try to give you a, a first formulation of, of, of the main theorem I want to talk about, particular introducing the, the Schwarzschild metric. Um, this is a nonlinear stability result and uh, nonlinear stability analysis naturally sort of partitions itself into the linear analysis and the actual nonlinear difficulties. So I will talk about those in, in sequence. And finally, I'll, I'll give you a future outlook um, about uh, problems in this field. So uh, off we go to uh, the first formulation of the theorem. Um, and in particular, I have to introduce the Schwarzschild file. So this is Schwarzschild. This is uh, his original paper uh, published in, in January 1916. And this is the Schwarzschild metric. So this is the first non-trivial solution of the Einstein vacuum equations to be written down. And in fact, it's a one parameter family of static spheric symmetric solutions of, of the equation Ricci curvature equals zero. So this describes uh, a Lorentzian four manifold um, whose Ricci curvature is equal to zero. So let me make some comments. Uh, you might have noticed the dates. So actually this, this, uh, this solution was, was discovered one month earlier, so in, in December 1915. And the Einstein vacuum equations were, were first written down in their final form in November 1915. So it was, it was quite remarkable. This was discovered uh, essentially um, immediately. Um, and this form of the, the, the metric is uh, contained actually in, in that paper of Schwarzschild. So it was very quick to, to, to discover this metric. It uh, took a lot longer to understand its geometry and in particular understand that secretly this metric represented what we now call a black hole space time. So, um, so the modern picture of Schwarzschild is actually what, what I've depicted here. So this is what's known as a, as a, as a Penrose diagram. Unfortunately, I won't be able uh, to describe these depictions in detail, nor will I really need them but they're certainly useful for those uh, who know. Let me just say a little bit about the history. So the, 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 the first person to really understand um, globally the Schwarzschild metric was actually the Irish relativist Singh. And this was understood in a, in a paper of 1950 based on previous uh, work of uh, Georges Lemaitre. Um, it took a while for this understanding to propagate to the rest of the theoretical physics community, and that propagation took place via a paper of, of Martin Kruskal, which somehow simplified the construction of Singh's paper. So in some sense, the space-time that I'm depicting is really the, the space-time that you will see in the papers of Singh and then later Kruskal. So what, what, what is it uh, that this picture supposedly depicts? What, what, what is it that we must carry away from, uh, from all of this? Um, well, one of the things that you see in this picture is a boundary called future null infinity. So this is what's depicted by this dotted line and labeled script I plus, sometimes uh, pronounced scry. So this is a boundary at infinity, which you should really think is sort of the, the radiation zone at infinity. So this is where sort of far away um, gravitational waves propagate to. So if you want to say it another way, uh, every time you hear about uh, sort of detection of gravitational waves, well, in, you should think that this is a process that uh, takes place at this boundary at infinity, and we're on that boundary too. So that's future null infinity. And what you're supposed to be able to read off this depiction is there is some region of space-time that cannot send signals to future null infinity. That is um, uh, sort of causally disconnected from future null infinity. And this is the darker, rated, uh, darker shaded region. Uh, in this picture. And this is exactly what we understand as a black hole region of space. So it's some region which cannot send signals to null infinity and it is uh, bounded in the past by, a, by a, something called the event horizon. And it happens to be bounded in the future by, by a singularity. Okay? And this sort of the presence of this singularity is related to all sorts of interesting questions in, um, 
general relativity, which, uh, however, this, this talk will not actually address. Um, so, um, so let me uh, sort of mention explicitly two things. One of these things will fortunately go away very quickly, but since I have this picture, I still have to say it. Um, there, there are two of various things exactly because this is this, this is secretly a two-ended uh, uh, space-time. And this is a little bit uh, confusing. In, in, in physics, black holes do not have two asymptotically flat ends, but this is sort of the price to pay for, for having this explicit purely vacuum uh, static solution. Okay? And uh, comment two, which, which will play a very important role in, in the talk, so I might as well already say it now, is that, um, the very nature of what it means to be a black hole means that the black hole region is disconnected causally with what's outside of it. So uh, space-time points in the black hole uh, region cannot send signals to uh, observers outside. And one of, this, uh, uh, one of the implications of this fact is that one can understand things about the exterior region without understanding what happens inside the black hole. So somehow that, that, that's something which will be very important. Uh, in this talk. Okay, so this is, um, this is the modern picture of the, the Schwarzschild uh, space-time. Um, and there's one other sort of uh, element that's extremely important, which is uh, the element of dynamics. And again, we have to remember that uh, it was a real accomplishment of, of um, mathematics to the theory of general relativity. They first understood that the, the Einstein equations are um, a well-posed theory. They are governed by a well-posed initial value problem, and so you can talk about dynamics. So this goes back to the work of Yvonne Choquebria from 1952, then known as Frebria. Uh, so she proved that given a notion of initial delta, there is a, a unique solution of the initial value problem for the, for the Einstein equations. It's known as the maximal Cauchy development. Well, the, the, the maximality aspect is a little bit more tricky and was worked out in a, in a later paper with um, uh, together with, with uh, Gerosh. So in particular, you can, you can understand dynamics. You can understand the question of, given such and such initial data, what is the relation of properties of the, the space-time that evolves from initial data to initial data? So this, this theorem is absolutely central in general in talking about dynamics in, in general relativity. And in particular, if we look at the Schwarzschild solution itself, of course, it's an explicit solution, but you can think of it dynamically as the Cauchy evolution that corresponds to, to, to two-ended Schwarzschild initial value. Okay? So this is sort of the dynamic point of view on Schwarzschild. And actually, uh, for, for the experts, I've, I've only uh, depicted here uh, the solution to the future of initial data, and that's because uh, I'm progressing. So one, one last uh, quick point um, for if there are any, I don't know who's sort of connected, but if there are any philosophers of physics or something like that, um, so one, one interesting thing about the, the sort of the maximal Cauchy development is that the original proof uh, actually appealed to, to Zornslama, in fact, twice. Um, and this sort of led to a debate in philosophy of science whether the existence of our space-time really depends on Zornslama, et cetera. So we can all rejoice in the fact that uh, this, uh, this result has actually been desornified. And so we can talk about dynamics of general relativity without uh, the axiom of choice. Great. Um, so, so now that we have dynamics, we can ask the obvious uh, stability question concerning Schwarzschild, which is, uh, we have Schwarzschild initial data, say that we perturb the initial data ever so slightly, and we evolve the Einstein vacuum equations, like Madame Choquebria told us that we can. Um, what happens to this space-time? Uh, is it like Schwarzschild? Does it remain close to Schwarzschild? Um, that's the, the, the question of orbital stability. Moreover, does it, does it approach uh, Schwarzschild? That's the question of asymptotic stability. And moreover, in some sense, because of this causal independence, we can ask these questions about the exterior of the black hole region without having to understand what happens in the interior of the black hole region. So that's the stability um, question. And actually, one thing that one immediately notices is that this question has nothing to do with this two-ended nature, and it immediately localizes to a, a characteristic initial value problem um, where, where you, you consider initial data, um, which is not a, a space-like hypersurface, but is, is actually sort of a, a bifurcate light cone, 
Sometimes this is actually a more natural notion of uh, initial data, especially when, when studying scattering. But in any case, the problem I claim immediately uh, localizes to this. Um, where one of these null hypersurfaces goes off to null infinity, so it's a, it's a null cone going uh, to infinity, and the other one goes a little bit into this uh, sort of black hole region, and you, 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 you stop, you can introduce a boundary, and you can just look at the region of Schwarzschild, which is uh, the sort of um, maximum development of this piece of initial data. So that's the region which is depicted here. And you can ask this question when you start with the data here. If you can solve this problem, then the, uh, the problem, the way I said it before, actually falls. Okay? So, um, so I'm not going to talk uh, more about that reduction, but it's actually now uh, completely standard. So you should really think of the stability question in Schwarzschild case as starting from two null cones as depicted in Schwarzschild. Okay? I have exactly Schwarzschild data. If I keep that and evolve, I get this picture. If I change the data ever so slowly and evolve, what happens? This is the question. Okay, so, so now I can tell you the uh, main theorem that I want to talk about in its first version. And as I said at the beginning, this is joint work with Holtzegel, Rodniansky, and Taylor. So the statement is that the Schwarzschild family is asymptotically stable in evolution under the fully nonlinear Einstein vacuum equations. So in the sense we were talking about all this time, without any symmetry assumptions, so not uh, sort of reducing the problem in any way like that. Um, in the black hole exterior, so I am claiming only stability for the black hole exterior, uh, the black hole interior is different. And as I said before, fortunately, one, one can hope to do this. One can hope to show stability in the exterior without knowing anything about the interior, basically. So, so this is the theorem, um, except that uh, this theorem, as I stated, for anyone who knows uh, general relativity, will know uh, uh, this statement cannot be true. Um, so this statement is true modulo something. So modulo what? Um, this, uh, this statement is true modulo the Kerr family. So, um, so this is Roy Kerr, uh, very deserving of all the medals that he's wearing, because in 1963, he discovered that uh, this uh, expression that I hope you can see here, um, which is a little bit complicated, but certainly not infinitely complicated, is a, a two parameter family of stationary axisymmetric uh, metrics which solve the, the, the Einstein vacuum equations, um, including Schwarzschild. So the parameters are M, this was the parameter uh, that we already have in Schwarzschild, and the additional parameter is A. So A equals zero corresponds to Schwarzschild. Now, the existence of this metric is actually much more subtle, and um, that's why it took so long uh, uh, to be uh, discovered. Okay. So um, it, is, um, it is less symmetric than Schwarzschild, in particular, it is, it is uh, only axis symmetric, it is not spherically symmetric. And if you want, that's, that's why it took more time to be discovered. The, the amount of symmetry this metric has is not sufficient to expect that you can find an explicit solution. And so the reason for its existence is tied to other hidden symmetries that, that it has, which are difficult to search for if you don't already know that they're there. So this is a, it looks like this is a one parameter family. Uh, this is a, sorry, a two parameter family and Schwarzschild is a one parameter subfamily. So it looks like Schwarzschild is co-dimension one in this family. But um, that's true in some sense abstractly, but if you realize concretely the moduli space of the initial data, then it is better to think of a Schwarzschild as a co-dimension three subfamily uh, in Kerr. And this is a slightly subtle point uh, for those of you not familiar with uh, this issue, but this is simply uh, related to the fact that uh, because uh, Schwarzschild is more symmetric than Kerr, okay, in order to realize the moduli space uh, smoothly, okay, you have to count different abstract realizations of Kerr uh, sort of uh, several times. So, um, so anyway, uh, please believe me uh, that when you, when you actually realize sort of the moduli space, uh, in, a, in a reasonable way, then uh, the Schwarzschild family uh, appears as co-dimension three subfamily as Kerr. Okay, so uh, given the presence of this family, 
we cannot have asymptotic stability of Schwarzschild without condition because there, no one prevents you from perturbing into this family. This is a stationary family of solutions. And thus, these solutions will never settle down to Schwarzschild. So you cannot have asymptotic stability once you know that this family exists. So, uh, so the second version of the theorem uh, tells you that precisely you have asymptotic stability modulo precisely this family. So the statement is the following. The Schwarzschild family is asymptotic stable, the black hole exterior without symmetry for the full expected set of perturbations. That's to say for a co-dimension three submanifold of the moduli space of vacuum initial dot. And the precise version, or the slightly more precise than in the last formulation that I gave you, version of the main theorem, uh, says that, um, so in particular, um, for this co-dimension three submanifold of the moduli space of vacuum initial data containing the Schwarzschild family, the corresponding solutions have the following property. They again possess a complete future null infinity. So there is this ideal boundary at infinity where far away observers in the radiation zone uh, live and this sort of this boundary is itself complete. So far away observers, if you want, they, they live forever. Um, moreover, the past of this boundary, okay, is bounded to the future by a, a future complete event horizon. Okay, beyond this horizon is is then the, the black hole region of the, the perturbed space. Okay. So the stable region is the region bounded between the event horizon and this sort of uh, boundary at infinity. Moreover, in that region, the space-time remains globally close to the original Schwarzschild metric. And finally, uh, it moreover asymptotes to another member of the Schwarzschild family as a suitable notion of time goes to infinity. And again, if you're familiar with um, sort of these depictions, these Penrose type depictions, the sort of direction of time going to infinity in this sense, so the, you know, the direction in which uh, as you evolve, you approach another member of the Schwarzschild family is exactly the direction of this arrow. So that, that is the theorem. So let me give uh, labels to these sort of various points of the theorem very quickly. So the first uh, statement um, is what's often called weak cosmic censorship, restricted, of course, to a neighborhood of Schwarzschild. Okay? So this, uh, this is the statement that far away observers, they live forever. So you might have black holes, you might have singularities in them, but far away observers live forever. So this is what's known as weak cosmic censorship. Um, and it's conjectured that this is actually true, not just in the neighborhood of Schwarzschild, but generically. Okay. The second statement is precisely the statement of orbital stability of Schwarzschild. And the last statement is the statement of asymptotic stability of Schwarzschild. Now, it is only really the last statement for which the restriction to co-dimension three is necessary. However, I have to emphasize in nonlinear stability results, the only way to prove one and two is by proving three. Okay? So it's for this reason that you really should think of one to three as a package. So I'm going to talk in, in uh, the rest of the talk, I'm going to mention a lot of previous things, but let me already uh, highlight some, uh, some select previous work to give some context to this theorem. So let me uh, begin with previous work without symmetry. So somehow the gold standard in, in this subject, nonlinear stability for asymptotically flat spacetimes, and still sort of a result that has not in any way been surpassed, is the nonlinear stability of Minkowski space. So this was first proven in the monumental work of Stodulu and Kleiderman in 1990. And there was then a, a, another proof um, in harmonic gauge by Lindblad and Rudnansky, uh, which has led to many subsequent developments. And there, there are people still writing papers about uh, this subject as we speak. So that's uh, sort of without symmetry in uh, the asymptotically flat regime. Now in symmetry classes, there is, um, first of all, some work from uh, a while ago. So nonlinear stability for Schwarzschild uh, in the context of the Einstein scalar field system was proven in spherical symmetry by Christodoulou. Um, you have to add scalar field and spherical symmetry in order to have non-trivial dynamics in view of something known as Birkhoff's theorem. Um, now, actually, he proved something much, much stronger than nonlinear stability. He proved that the generic solution of this system either disperses or settles down to Schwarzschild. Uh, so he, he actually, in particular, proved what's known as weak cosmic censorship for the system. And then this was followed by some uh, early work of mine with Rodnianski, where we, we, we proved the stronger asymptotic 
uh, stability result. In fact, again, this result is valid not just for small perturbations of, of Schwarzschild, but for any solution that settles down uh, that does not disperse. So, uh, so there's that. Um, now, as far as vacuum is concerned, uh, even though you, you don't have um, spherically symmetric vacuum, if you go to five dimensions, um, then there is a sort of analog of, of spherical symmetry, which is more complicated, called Bianchi 9 symmetry, which the vacuum equations admit. So you can, you can entertain the problem of nonlinear stability of five-dimensional Schwarzschild in, under symmetry. And uh, this was uh, first uh, addressed by Holtzegel. So this was first proven in Holtzegel in, in his thesis, actually. So both these problems are one plus one dimensional problems. So in some sense, the analysis of this problem uh, by modern standards is, is quite easy, at least uh, if you only want to prove stability. And these results really should be thought of as special cases as more general large data results for these systems, which are completely still unavailable and beyond symmetry. Um, so, um, so that's sort of a, a special feature of one plus one dimensional symmetry. Once you go beyond one plus one dimensions, then you start to see the difficulties of the full problem. Uh, and that's why by far the, the most impressive uh, previous work on, on this subject is a recent nonlinear stability four dimensional Schwarzschild for the Einstein vacuum equations under something called polarized axis symmetry. So, this is work of Kleinerman Schiftel, uh, and this is really the first uh, result beyond one plus one. Okay? So, um, so, this actually has a, a lot of the features of, of, of the full problem, and uh, this proof will use in particular some of the linear analysis that I'll talk about uh, later that we have developed. Uh, and also many other things. Okay. So, um, so that's the situation for asymptotically flat. And maybe let me also uh, mention very briefly, so you can also put a cosmological constant on the right-hand side of the Einstein equation of, of, of either sign. I'll talk about this at the end, actually, but maybe I should mention already now at the beginning, in the, in the positive case, um, well, Minkowski space is, is replaced by something known as the Sitter space, and uh, Kerr, has a cousin in this world, which is known as Kerr de Sitter. And uh, the nonlinear stability of, of de Sitter was proven by Friedrich back in the, in the 80s. And remarkably, the nonlinear stability for very slowly rotating Kerr de Sitter was proven by, by Hintz and Bassi. Okay? So this problem also has some of the features of, of the problem that, that I want to discuss in this talk, but, but um, from other uh, points of view, it, it, it is similar. So uh, onward, so let me, uh, as promised, talk about the linear problem, and then uh, I'll go on to talk about the, the, the nonlinear difficulties. So uh, linear stability of Schwarzschild. So uh, this is a venerable topic, and the first paper to consider it uh, was written in the 50s, actually by my academic grandpa, Johnny Wheeler uh, and Reggie. Uh, so this is the, the uh, this is the paper. Um, so actually, if, if you take this abstract literally, then it seems that uh, the linear stability of Schwarzschild was shown in this paper. Um, unfortunately, that's, that's not uh, quite correct. Um, but this paper did introduce uh, various uh, things into the problem, some things which I'll actually talk about. One, one thing I do want to mention, uh, and it's a sign of the times in which this paper was written. So you'll see in the title, this is called Stability of Schwarzschild Singularity. Well, this sort of dates the paper uh, from uh, before the time when the fact that the event horizon of Schwarzschild was not singular was understood. So in particular, uh, in this paper, uh, that was not yet, I mean, it had been understood by other people, but this understanding had not propagated to, uh, to the physics department in Princeton. Um, so, um, so actually, uh, in, uh, from the point of view of this paper, it was thought that the event horizon was something singular uh, on which one has to impose boundary conditions. Okay? But in any case, that, um, that's just um, sort of the sign of the, the time in which that was written. So, uh, so what do I mean when I say linear stability? It's actually, um, I think it's important to clarify this uh, because um, if you don't understand linear what linear stability should mean, then uh, it's very difficult to um, uh, understand sort of the difficulties of the problem and understand sort of what you need to do in nonlinear problems. So, um, so what does linear stability mean? So somehow if, you know, in a lot of mathematical physics, when 
somehow you cannot really talk about the nonlinear theory period. So in a lot of quantum field theory, for instance, well, the only thing you can define is the linear theory and any result about the linear theory, you can baptize as linear stability. Um, but in a theory where there is actually a, a well-posed initial value problem, there is actually dynamics. Um, it's very important that whatever you call linear stability should have some interpretation about the full problem. Okay? And so what I'm going to list here is the minimal uh, amount of things that are necessary uh, at, at the purely linear level for whatever you're saying to actually have content about the fully nonlinear theory. So, um, so the first thing is the following. Uh, before doing anything else, you have to pick a gauge in which the Einstein vacuum equations um, uh, reduce to a well-posed uh, problem. Okay, so it's very well known that the, the Einstein equations, if you write them in, in what used to be called generally covariant uh, form, um, uh, well, they, they aren't of any type. So those equations per se are not well posed because of diffeomorphism invariance. And um, there are all sorts of gauges that you can try to impose, but most of those gauges are not well posed. So if you impose those gauges and look at the reduced equations, then there's no initial value. So uh, step one is you have to pick a gauge in which the equations are well posed. The simplest example is actually what's known as harmonic gauge. This was what was used to show local existence by Yvonne choquet bra So in that gauge, the equations reduce to this system of omega wave equations. So you first reduce the equations and then you linearize. So it's important to do things in this order. If you linearize without first reducing by something well posed, then what you do will have no interpretation of the nonlinear theory because of the postness. So this is already something that, that, that really should be stressed. So you linearize the system, whatever it is. So in the case of harmonic gauge, you take this sort of awful system and you linearize it. And now you try to show things for this linearized system. So in particular, you try to show that the solutions of the reduced linearized system remain bounded. This is what's known as orbital stability. And you try to show that solutions of the reduced linearized system they, they decay. Um, this is what's known as asymptotic stability. And already at this point, for many gauges of interest, as we'll see, um, this will not be true unless you add um, what I'll call a, a residual pure gauge solution. You see, uh, most gauges that one impose do not completely uh, fix uh, the, the gauge. So for instance, if you impose harmonic gauge, okay, there are still pure gauge solutions, which are in harmonic gauge. So, um, so very often in order to achieve asymptotic stability, you have, to you have to add an additional sort of residual pure gauge solution. Residual means that it, 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 it is a solution of the reduced system, okay? The well-posed reduced system. Okay. And for various technical reasons, it's, it's actually important that if, if that's the case, what you add should also be bounded. So finally, or, or fifth on the list, um, you should make sure that this decay that you're proving is sufficiently fast. Um, this will actually come up very late in the talk when I, when I go to, um, to, to negative cosmological constant. But um, in particular, if, if your linearized uh, system decays, but very slowly, let's say, only uh, polynomially at a very slow rate, or maybe even inverse uh, logarithmically or something like that, then, okay, you can call that stability, but already at the next order of perturbation theory, naively at least, that suggests that the solution will, will grow in time. Because if you integrate, let's say, one over log, this is something clearly divergent. So, um, so of course, this is semantics, but in some sense, uh, such a linear result uh, would not be suggestive of, of, of stability. It's actually suggestive of, of, of instability. So you, you really need to prove that you have a, a polynomial decay, let's say at least, um, which is sufficiently fast. And finally, uh, uh, okay, this is optional, but one has extra credit if you can do all of this avoiding completely frequency and mode decompositions. Um, that I'll say that sort of extra credit, much more fundamental, uh, you, it's very preferable if you can do this uh, using um, the energy concept. And we'll, we'll get to why that's the case when we go to the nonlinear theory. If you can do this using the energy 
concept, then you're sort of halfway there for understanding uh, the nonlinear theory before you've even written down a single nonlinear term for reasons like this. Okay. So, uh, uh, excuse me, does it mean that one should avoid micro local analysis? It simply means, I mean, in principle, of course, if one can do things in physical space, that, that's, uh, you know, that, that's simpler. Um, it doesn't mean that you should avoid, per se, any micro-local analysis or something like that. Uh, but it does mean that you should, you should achieve a result that you can formulate uh, at the energy level without loss of derivatives. So if you want a true stability result, then, then that's the type of result that you should, you should really formulate. If you have that type of result, then sort of, you know, this really automatically um, is relevant for the nonlinear problem. If you don't, then you can still hope to do the nonlinear problem, but then there are additional uh, difficulties that you, you then have to address. So, um, okay. So, um, so I will present the first such linear stability uh, result. Uh, so this is a result uh, of uh, myself with uh, Holzigl and Modnyansky that we've uh, uh, actually, we, we obtained uh, several years ago, and I guess it was published in, in, in 2019. Um, and this, um, this linear stability was actually sh shown in something called double null gauge. So I will explain later what exactly double null gauge is. Let me just uh, say for now that it is indeed a well-posed reduction of the, the Einstein vacuum equations. And in fact, this is precisely uh, the reduction of the Einstein vacuum equations that has been used to prove many of the nonlinear results that, that we know and love about the, the Einstein vacuum equations. I'll, I'll explain later exactly what this gauge is. So let me first give you a, a, a formulation of the theorem so that you can, you can see. So, uh, so this is a linear result. So it's, it's taking place on a fixed Schwarzschild exterior background. Okay. And again, you can formulate it starting from these characteristic initial surfaces. This is very natural actually in double null gauge because these, are, uh, these turn out to be surfaces of constant uh, double null coordinates, okay? So, so the statement is uh, all solutions to the linearized Einstein vacuum equations in this gauge around Schwarzschild arising from regular asymptotically flat initial data on these sort of double null cones, they do indeed remain bounded on the exterior. And moreover, they decay inverse polynomially through a suitable foliation of this darker shaded region to a standard linearized Kerr solution, okay? So, and we'll get back to this point very soon. Because the Schwarzschild family is sitting inside Kerr, okay, then you will see the Kerr family in linear theory as linearized Kerr solutions, okay? And uh, the only thing, the best you can hope to decay to is thus a linearized Kerr solution, okay? So that's what's shown. And you'll see that you have this extra feature that this is only true after you add a residual pure gauge solution. That's to say a pure gauge solution that again satisfies the reduced vacuum equation, which itself is uh, bounded and can be estimated quantitatively by size of the data. Okay, so that, that, is, that is the theory. Okay. Um, so um, let me immediately give you an aside. Uh, so this was the, the, the first linear stability theorem of this type. Uh, subsequently, uh, linear stability has also been uh, shown in harmonic and what's known as generalized harmonic gauge. Sometimes harmonic gauge is known as wave gauge, which in some sense makes more sense in a view of the, sim of the um, uh, signature of the metric. Um, and so this is the, the uh, theorem of, of Tom Johnson. Uh, published uh, recently. So this is really a precise analog of our theorem, but in this other gauge. And uh, this uh, type of result has also been proven by Hung and Hung Keller Wang. Uh, so this is a group from uh, Columbia University and recently been generalized or some version of this generalized to occur by Hefner, Hintz and Bass. Okay. All right, but I'm going to talk about um, uh, uh, sort of uh, double null gauge, although the sort of the, the first comments I, I will make in some sense apply uh, no matter what uh, gauge you want to use, that very often uh, it's useful sort of in, in a step one to consider what are known as gauge invariant quantities. So it's been well known um, 
starting from the work of, of, uh, of uh, Reggie Wheeler, but actually this was not completed in, in that paper of Reggie Wheeler, that you can parameterize sort of the gauge invariant perturbations in two uh, different ways. So there's something called the, the theory of gauge invariant metric perturbations. This is um, what was started with uh, Reggie Wheeler and uh, completed with uh, Zerui. Uh, but there's another way, um, sort of by the extremal components in the, the Newman Penrose formalism of curvature. So I'm not going to explain at this point what this exactly is, but there is some curvature component. It's actually curvature expressed in a double null frame. It's some sort of component of curvature, you can think. Um, so alpha plus two and, and alpha minus two. So it's, it's two components. These are actually, you should think of them as traceless transverse, um, uh, I'm sorry, tr traceless symmetric uh, tensors, uh, but uh, you can scalarize. So you can think of these as two complex numbers if you prefer, okay? And these parameterize the, the, the gauge invariant quantities in the following sense. If you have a solution of linearized um, vacuum equations and these two things are zero, then the solution is pure gauge plus a linearized curve. Okay. So, um, so in some sense, uh, step one of the problem is to try to control these properties and then try to understand also the, the pure gauge aspect. Now, I, I, I want to stress that very often in the, in the physics literature, one stops at understanding the gauge invariant quantities and says that, oh, the rest is pure gauge, so we don't have to worry about it. Um, well, again, you can declare that to be linear stability, but if that's all you have, you'll never understand the, the actual Einstein equations. And the reason is that in order to relate linear theory to nonlinear theory, you need a well-posed gauge. And so if you don't know how to understand the gauge-reduced equations, then there's nothing you can do with that statement on its own. Nonetheless, it's a very useful statement as, as, we, as we will see. Okay. So, um, so we're actually going to look at this, um, uh, these quantities alpha plus two and minus two, these sort of curvature components. And um, so these uh, remarkably, they, they decouple from the full system and they satisfy something which is known as the, the Bardeen press equation. And this decoupling actually uh, survives when you, when you look not just at Schwarzschild, when you look at linearized gravity around Kerr. And in that context, uh, this, this equation is known as the Tukolsky equation. So, um, so I've written the Tukolsky equation in, in, in the Kerr case here. So it's, it's a wave equation for this, these two complex scalars, if you want. So the, the highest order term is just the covariant wave operator uh, applied to alpha, but you have a lot of uh, sort of lower order terms. You have first order terms, zero order terms, et cetera. Um, so, so I will refer to this equation, even the Schwarzschild case, as the Tukolsky equation, because this is now the standard terminology. So, um, so in particular, one of the things that you have to prove on the way, so I'll state this as a corollary, but it's actually something you prove on the way, is that all solutions of, of the Tukolsky equation uh, on Schwarzschild, uh, they remain quantitatively bounded from initial data, and in fact, they decay inverse polynomially with respect to, to time. Okay, so this is one of the features of what you have to do is prove this. Okay. And let me just say that this, uh, this result uh, generalizes to very slowly rotating curve. Uh, so this is work uh, of myself and Holzikl and Rodnianski and also uh, pretty much in parallel uh, by Ma, uh, again, using what we had done previously in the Schwarzschild case. And actually has recently been uh, generalized uh, to the full sub-extreme Mocker case by Schlappendorf, Rothman, and Teixeira da Costa. And uh, I think we'll, we'll appear there very soon. So, um, so this Tukolsky equation, whatever it is, it's, its highest order term is the wave equation, then you have all these other terms. So clearly a simpler problem than understanding this equation on Schwarzschild or Kerr is understanding the, the scalar wave equation on Schwarzschild or Kerr. And, uh, this is, a, this is a subject that had a lot of uh, attention in recent years. Well, there are classical results uh, on the wave equation Schwarzschild by Wald and, and K. Wald proving, proving quantitative boundedness. Uh, there's a mode stability result, which is very important due to Whiting. And then uh, in the last 15 years, many, many people worked on this problem in the sort of, uh, from the point of view of, of, of analysis. And in some sense, the final theorem that one can 
obtain, which in some sense uh, summarizes exactly uh, what you need about this about scalar wave equation, if you ever want to address nonlinear problems, is contained in this paper of um, uh, which is joined with uh, Rodniansky and Schlaff and Tov-Rothman, where we proved polynomial decay for general solutions of the wave equation, without any symmetry or anything like that, um, in the general uh, sub-extremal uh, class, and also quantitative bounding. So we proved that, in particular, that there's an upper bound to the strength of superradiant amplification. So let me just say that it's actually in, in this type of analysis where a lot of the geometry of black holes a lot of the geometric phenomena of black holes interact with the analysis. So in particular, the celebrated redshift effect at the horizon, the trapped null geodesics, which are related to the photon sphere. So this is something that all of us in some sense have seen a little bit of in those nice pictures from the black hole telescope. Well, the sort of, those pictures are related to serious difficulties in trying to analytically understand uh, sort of boundedness and decay properties for, for, for wave equations. This issue of superradiance, which is a Kerr issue, which I won't talk about more, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, I, I can't not say that actually uh, the, 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 this Kerr family is a black hole, not just in, in this parameter range, but in the so-called extremal case also, where the rotation parameter is equal to M. And, and there you have a completely new phenomenon, uh, which was discovered around 10 years ago, uh, which is called the Ariatakis instability. And there's a lot of work on, on that. Although recently, a mode stability result has been shown uh, by Teixeira and Akosh. So sort of, uh, there's still a lot to understand, even at the linear level, about extremal curve. And this is actually something which is interesting, both from the point of view of high energy physics and also from, from the point of view of um, uh, astronomy. OK. So, so now let's go back to our actual problem. And let me tell you how, how you prove decay for the Tucholsky equation on Schwarzschild. And, and this was actually tricky, um, but it turned out that uh, the way to do it was to uh, borrow an idea from, from uh, Chandrasekhar and then use it in a, in, a, in a new way. So the idea is the following. So uh, Chandrasekhar uh, had uh, studied at the fixed frequency level uh, a series of transformations that related these various gauge invariant quantities. And it turns out that some of those transformations, though not all, you can reinterpret in, in, in physical space. So we, we did that, and in particular, you can, um, uh, you can define sort of a, a, let's call it a transformation between the uh, Tukolsky equation and this other equation, the, the, the Reggie Wheeler equation, by, in just in physical space, applying two null derivatives to this curvature quantity uh, with uh, appropriate weights, okay? So remember, sort of curvature is already two derivatives of the metric. You take two more derivatives, that's four derivatives of the metric. So you have some quantity P, okay? So this is, again, it's a gauge invariant quantity. Uh, and remarkably, this quantity uh, that you produced from this ugly Tukolsky equation it satisfies uh, something known as the Reggie Wheeler equation. So this equation was in that first paper of, 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 of Reggie and Wheeler. And anyway, I don't want to really explain all the notation here, but this equation is, is actually just like the wave equation, the scalar wave equation. In some sense, it's actually cleaner than the scalar wave equation secretly. It just, you, you, you have to understand a little bit the tensorial structure, but it's actually better. So everything that you could do for the scalar wave equation, you can do to this equation. Um, so in particular, you can understand boundedness, you can understand what's called integrated local energy decay, you can understand polynomial decay, you can understand everything. And well, it turns what, out that... What do you mean by being cleaner? Uh, cleaner means that, uh, so it looks like this equation has zeroth order terms. But those zeroth order terms are actually, they, in some sense, they have a good sign. And so in some of the technical difficulties that you have in trying to understand the wave equation using the energy method, it's actually very, it's, it's cleaner for this. Uh, so, so it's like the Klein-Gordon equation, which has a mass or? It's not really like the Klein-Gordon equation in the sense that these, uh, these uh, lower order terms, they decay in R. So it doesn't, these lower order terms don't change the sorts of, you know, the, the, the Klein-Gordon equation is very different from the wave equation in its radiative properties. So this sort ah, of- that, so, that, so, so it's a Klein-Gordon equation with a position-dependent mass, which- Right, exactly. 
exactly, exactly. So, so this equation you can understand. And then the, the sort of the physical space uh, approach tells you the following. If I understand this equation and I prove indeed uh, decay for this equation, I can go back and understand my original alpha by integrating the definition of these p plus two and p minus two as transport equations. Okay? And this is something that you couldn't do in the sort of the fixed frequency theory because it looked like you had to invert these transformations and that's, um, there are obstructions to doing that actually. All right, so that was somehow the, the, the key to understanding Tucholsky on Schwarzschild. Um, so I, I guess this is written here. And, and now it turns out that even though you don't have these exact transformations in the current, in fact, Chandra Sekhar tried very hard to find versions of these exact transformations in current. Uh, if you do the physical space definitions uh, of these transformations, you'll get error terms, but this uh, is actually robust to the presence of these error terms. And this is what allows you to, to use this to understand um, relatively easily the, the small A case, and with a little bit more work, uh, you can understand uh, the, the complete sub extremal case. Um, so that's step one in, in the linear theory. Uh, so let me go on immediately to, to, to step two, which is actually the, the much harder step, which is going from Tukolsky to the full linear system. Um, so, uh, so now is a good time to give you this quote uh, from uh, Chandra Sekhar. Um, uh, the analysis has led us into a realm of the Rococo splendorous, joyful, and immensely ornate. So I'm going to show you the full linearized system of double null gauge. So I haven't told you yet what double null gauge is, so let me tell you very, very quickly what is double null gauge. So it's the following. You think that you're um, foliating your space-time by two families of null cones, what you can think of as outgoing null cones going to null infinity, and ingoing null cones going into the black hole, going to the event horizon. So you can foliate your, your space-time. So you have these two families of double null cones, and they intersect in spheres, okay? So the equations you write down are actually the structure equations of this foliation, given that your spacetime is, is Ricci flat, okay? So it's what the differential geometer would do, okay? And you think of this system of equations as the Einstein equations, okay? And it turns out that this formulation of the Einstein equations is well posed and is actually very, very useful in nonlinear analysis. But as we'll see, it's also very useful for linear analysis. So what are the unknowns? Well, the unknowns before you linearize are um, the, if you want the second fundamental form, okay, of these foliations, okay? So, so these are the quantities that uh, are denoted here uh, by uh, the Greek letter he. For instance, this is the, um, second fundamental form of the outgoing null cones, he bars the second fundamental form of the ingoing null cones, et cetera, et cetera. Now, because you have this double null foliation, you also have a sort of canonical double null frame that you can associate to that. And you can take the curvature tensor R uh, and you can decompose in terms of this double null frame. And this gives you curvature components. So these curvature components is what's written here as formula 74. And so they're denoted traditionally alpha, beta, rho, sigma, anyway. And particularly this alpha is precisely the alpha that satisfies the Tchaikovsky equation. So the gauge invariant quantity that we already control is a quantity which naturally appears in, in, in the system. Okay, so these are the unknowns. So what are the equations? Well, as I told you, the equations are the equations of differential geometry. So if that's to say the, the, the Gauss and, and uh, Kodatsi uh, uh, equations and, and first variation equations of your foliation. So these are the equations that are written on, on the, the right piece of uh, paper. This is all taken from that paper. Um, uh, so you'll see in particular, these equations are transport equations and uh, elliptic equations. So the Kodatsi equations of differential geometry, for instance, are, are naturally elliptic equations on, on spheres. And the Bianchi equations. So the curvature, uh, we all know from differential geometry, it satisfies the Bianchi equations. And if you want hyperbolicity in this business, it lives in the Bianchi equations, okay? So this is where this well-posed 
formulation of the Einstein equation sees the hyperbolicity of, of the Einstein equation. So it's complicated, there are lots of equations, um, but you know, sort of if you're a numerical analyst who, or rather if you're, uh, if you're a numerical relativist who wants to simulate the Einstein equations on, on the computer, it's, not, it's nice to have the least number of equations as possible so that you can sort of write it in close form and solve. But if you're an analyst doing estimates, well, the more equations, the more estimates. So you shouldn't be afraid of, of having more equations, of having redundancy. It actually exposes the structure better. So, so, that's, uh, so these are the equations, and then you linearize this. Okay, so, well, anyway, I'm not going to really try to explain this notation, but you take this equation and you linearize around the Schwarzschild solution, and you get this sort of system of equation for linearized quantities. So, um, so how do you unravel this? Well, let me focus on uh, sort of one particular equation. So here it is. Um, so this is, uh, this is uh, 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 so we sort of know these equations from differential geometry. So this is a transport equation associated to um, ingoing and outgoing null cones. So this is uh, an equation that the second fundamental form, actually it's, it's traceless part. So this is known as the shear the shear of these light cones satisfies. And on the right-hand side of this equation, you see precisely curvature. And in particular, you see this special quantity of curvature that's been understood. So given decay for curvature, then you can integrate this as the transport equation. And so in particular, you immediately get that the shear, this quantity here, say the ingoing shear, the shear of these ingoing cones is bounded. But you also immediately see that you will never be able to prove decay for the shear, okay? And the reason is that the only way to estimate this quantity is exactly by estimating this equation as a transport equation. So you'll always pick up initial W. So if you want this quantity to decay, if you want your solution to actually approach in standard form linearized uh, Kerr, okay, then you have to make this quantity zero in the future. And the way you do this is you have to add a residual pure gauge solution. And you can do that. And in fact, there's a geometric interpretation of what you're doing. You're actually picking a special sphere and you can actually decide where you want that sphere to be. For instance, you can make it on the horizon. You pick a sphere in the future and you say that sphere is special. Okay? And this is sort of related to the fact that double null foliation, well, there are lots of them because you can pick any sphere to start from. In particular, you can also pick normalizations of the, the null cones. Okay? So if you want your solution to actually decay to uh, Schwarzschild or Kerr in the standard form, okay, you have to pick that in the future. So picking that sphere in the future is exactly what we do uh, in this analysis. Okay. Um, so that corresponds to, to part four. Okay. So, uh, so as I said, uh, you show decay, but you don't show decay to zero. You show decay to uh, either a sort of linearized Schwarzschild solution or a linearized Kerr solution. And you can work out explicitly what, uh, what these solutions are. And actually conveniently in, in uh, linear theory, it, it turns out, I mean, this is not so much a fundamental point, but it's convenient. Um, these, um, these solutions, in some sense, they live only in the zero and one um, uh, spherical harmonics, and uh, they completely govern the zero and one spherical harmonics. So in particular, um, uh, because of that, you can identify these solutions already at the level of initial data. Okay? If I look at initial data and the linearized system, I know exactly what linearized Kerr solution I'm going to um, approach. So, um, so that's basically the, the, the linear story. Um, here is again the, um, <clears throat> the um, linear theorem. Um, so before turning to the nonlinear <clears throat> story, I'm going to uh, vandalize uh, my, uh, my linear theorem uh, with the permission of <clears throat> my uh, collaborators, um, because it's actually the, the, the vandalization of the, the linear theorem which, uh, which will be the basis of the nonlinear. 
So this is linear stability of Schwarzschild, but actually, strictly speaking, this is a stronger result, what's stated here. What's stated here is linear stability of the Kerr family around Schwarzschild. Because what is shown is that if I linearize around Schwarzschild, the Kerr family is linearly stable. I approach a linearized Kerr set. So in some sense, linear stability of Schwarzschild is the following substatement, okay? That, so in particular, there exists a co-dimension three subset of initial data, okay? Such that if I restrict to this co-dimension three subset, uh, I actually uh, approach Schwarzschild, not Kerr, Schwarzschild. And in fact, because of the comments that I just said, you can actually identify this co-dimensional subset explicitly if you want to at the level of the initial data. So this is the linear result that I want to now turn into a nonlinear result. Okay. So let me uh, say um, very quickly uh, the nonlinear difficulties. And obviously, because of the time, I'm not going to uh, uh, come close to doing justice to, to some of the uh, complications. Let me say at the beginning that the the sort of the, the beacon that one wants to follow is um, the global nonlinear stability of Minkowski space. Okay, and this is very much a, a model for these type of nonlinear stability results. And and moreover, the methods that were introduced in, in this work are are actually relevant beyond even the question of stability. So for, for purely large data problems. So um, um, so let me say some words about uh, the difficulty. So one thing I already alluded to when I talked about linear stability, and it's the following. Because we, we got extra credit, because we did everything entirely based on energy estimates, then uh, all the linear techniques, they can be applied directly to the nonlinear problem. That's to say, uh, secretly, we have not proved just the result about fixed background. Okay? We have proved estimates on a dynamic background that approaches uh, Schwarzschild uh, consistent with the estimates that were proven. So that's exactly the way you use linear analysis in a nonlinear problem. And just because of the method, uh, that's, that's already done. Okay? And, and this is exactly, if you want, um, one of the main insights uh, in the theory of nonlinear wave equations in the 1980s, sort of the work of, um, for instance, Kleinerman, uh, that this is the right way to do linear analysis. If you do linear analysis like this, then sort of your, your linear analysis is robust to immediately apply to nonlinear problems. If, if you don't, then you, know, you, you start struggling with uh, Nash-Moser and things like that. And that's, a, that's an even uh, worse black hole than Schwarzschild. So, so this difficulty in some sense um, uh, is already addressed. Um, so another very important difficulty, and this will elucidate the role of double null gauge, is the so-called null condition. So it is not true that for all nonlinear equations that linearize to the same thing, you should expect nonlinear stability because it's really highly dependent on the nature of the nonlinear terms. And in fact, equations that we know in love in mathematical physics, like the Euler equations uh, for um, compressible fluid uh, dynamics, in three plus one dimensions, they linearize to the good old wave equation. Nonetheless, you don't have nonlinear stability. And the reason you don't have nonlinear stability of the trivial solution in that case is precisely because the equations do not satisfy what's known as the null condition. Okay? So the formalization of this null condition is again due to Kleiner. So in the case of the Einstein equations, secretly the null condition is there, but it's hard to find. In particular, if you write the null the Einstein equations in harmonic coordinates. It's secretly there, at least some weak version of it, but uh, it's not really apparent. When you write the Einstein equations in double null gauge, you see immediately the, the, the null condition. So double null gauge is sort of tailor-made to easily dealing with all the nonlinear issues related to sort of quadratic terms in the nonlinear. And this has been used by, by many people, um, including the people uh, listed here. So in particular, uh, how do you see this? Uh, sort of, what do I mean by nonlinear terms and nonlinear structure? Well, here are this awful set of equations. Here are, for instance, the Bianchi equations. This is part of the system in double null gauge. And here is some random nonlinear term. So this is a term that when you linearize, it, uh, it disappears. Um, so this term, well, whatever this notation is, this is a geometric product between curvature and, and a shear. And because of its geometric nature, Okay? It actually has good decay 
properties, much better decay properties than the generic quadratic sort of expression that you could write down. This is key and you see it immediately in, 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 in this formulation. So I'm going to skip um, this, uh, uh, that slide. Uh, so let me go uh, finally to the, to the issue of, of, of teleology. So already in linear theory, one aspect of double null gauge, and actually one aspect of any geometric gauge, which is based on transport equations, okay, is that you will have to sort of normalize the gauge teleologically from the future. You will have to sort of, you know, uh, that you always have to do this, okay? And we already saw this in, 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 in linear theory, okay? In order to have decay to linearized Kerr, you, you had to add a pure gauge solution, okay? Which effectively selected the sphere and normalization of two null cones in the future. So you also have to do this, of course, in the nonlinear theory, and it's a little more complicated. In fact, there are two distinct um, double null foliations that we use. Uh, which are normalized one to null infinity, the other uh, to the event horizon. And moreover, all this procedure, you have to do it sort of continuously in, in the context of the bootstrap argument. But um, this is something which is very familiar to people working on nonlinear problems. Um, and again, the beauty of bootstrap arguments is that they are not only um, the way we understand stability problems, we also understand large data problems. Um, and there's a, there are a few additional features that, that enter in this teleology in, in nonlinear theory. So I told you before that in linear theory, um, the sort of linearized uh, Kerr and Schwarzschild solutions, okay, they, they actually sort of, you can identify them at the level of initial data. So here were those solutions. Um, well, in, in, in nonlinear theory, much like the, the teleological gauge, uh, which already in linear theory, you cannot explicitly uh, see it in, 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 in um, uh, initial data. Well, in nonlinear theory, also this, this linearized solution, you also have to understand them teleologically. And for this reason, uh, if you want to identify and exclude the solutions that are actually asymptoting to occur, you have to find them teleologically. And for this reason, this co-dimension three submanifold of initial data that, uh, that approaches Schwarzschild, uh, this is only determined uh, teleologically. Okay? So it's not determined explicitly from initial data. You cannot. Okay? It is only inferred from looking at the future and going to the past. So this is another aspect uh, of the problem. But it turns out that in some sense, um, this, uh, this difficulty is dwarfed by the difficulty of just teleologically normalizing the gauge, which already was present in, in linear theory. So it's nice to have some examples of explicit initial data, which uh, are in this co-dimension three uh, family. And it turns out that here, uh, symmetry uh, uh, can help. So in particular, if my initial data is axisymmetric and has vanishing angular momentum, then it's well known that angular momentum cannot radiate to null infinity. So the only thing that such initial data could uh, uh, um, converge to in the future is Schwarzschild. It cannot converge to Kerr because it cannot acquire angular momentum. This is something special about axisymmetry. So in particular, such uh, initial data have to be in our co-dimension three family. Um, and what's nice about this data is, okay, you can, you can check that your data satisfies this explicitly. And um, so it turns out that uh, the uh, polarized axisymmetric initial data, which um, uh, was considered in the, uh, the spectacular work of Kleinerman and Schriftel that I mentioned at the beginning uh, is, is actually a subcase of what I just said. So in particular, those solutions are also, of course, included in, in this family. Okay, so let me, in the last minus four minutes, uh, talk about uh, the, uh, my outlook. Um, so, um, well, obviously, uh, one wants to uh, sort of complete a proof of the full nonlinear stability of, of the Kerr family in the sub-extremal um, uh, uh, range. Uh, the extremal case uh, will, will hide many surprises, so let me not even speculate about what's, what's going on exactly at, at extremality. Um, so I'll, I'll just uh, sort of, uh, I mean, this is a, an obvious uh, thing to, um, to resolve now. And um, 
uh, I have no doubt that this will be resolved very, very soon. So as I'm someone who looks uh, towards the future, let me uh, leave you with this uh, slide and go, go forward. Um, so I already talked about the case of positive cosmological constant. And I mentioned uh, the very nice work of Hinz and Vasi, where the cousin of the Kerr solution in, in a world with a positive cosmological constant was, was proven to be nonlinearly stable already in, in, um, uh, in, in the so-called very slowly rotating case. Um, now, in, it turns out that in, in high energy physics, what people are actually very interested is the case of negative cosmological constant. It turns out that this case is perhaps the most interesting case. Uh, so if you add a negative cosmological constant to the Einstein equations, then the um, cousin of the Kerr family is the so-called Kerr antidecitor family. And this family's Penrose diagram is uh, depicted here. It's very familiar to people working in high energy physics. Now, infinity is time-like. So if you want to understand dynamics in this context, you actually have to include also boundary conditions at infinity. And the natural thing to include, um, at least the most natural thing, is so-called reflective boundary conditions. So in a remarkable theorem a few years ago, Holtzegel and Zulevic showed that if you just take the linear wave equation on this background with reflective boundary conditions at infinity, then solutions outside the black hole, they do decay but they decay only inverse logarithmically. And in fact, this decay is sharp. And so um, if you remember my comments from before, if you're proving supposedly nonlinear stability, but all you're proving is something like logarithmic decay and moreover that sharp, then looking at second order perturbation theory, you might think that that actually suggests that at the nonlinear level you have instability. This is precisely what uh, Holtzegel and Zmilevic conjecture. So they conjecture that Kerr antidecider is actually nonlinearly unstable with reflective boundary conditions. And what's very remarkable about this conjecture is that uh, if, if true, it's a, it's a completely nonlinear result. Now, actually, this should be compared with a recent spectacular theorem of Yorgos Moschidis, who showed that pure ADS, so this is the analog of Minkowski space in negative cosmological constant, is indeed nonlinearly unstable. And he showed it actually for the einstein blasov system and also the, the uh, Einstein scalar field system. So, um, so you can have uh, purely nonlinear instability precisely because of the lack of or the slow decay. But whereas in the pure ADS case, you, you have no decay of the linear problem, in, in Kerr antidecider, you have a little bit of decay. So it is quite unclear whether that little bit of decay finally is enough to show nonlinear stability, or indeed, uh, as I uh, suggested earlier, uh, gives you nonlinear instability. And uh, there's actually already a lot of very speculative literature in the, in the physics community on this issue. And this is precisely the type of question that mathematics uh, will be able to solve, I think, in, in the future. And this will be a very big um, sort of uh, contribution of, of so nonlinear mathematical analysis to a problem of intense interest in theoretical physics. So this is a great problem for people to work on in the future. So let me end there. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much. So let me unmute everybody so we can uh, upload the... Uh... So I'm going to mute everybody again. And, uh, but people can unmute themselves. So, so first, let me ask a question, uh, which is from uh, Jose Natario in the chat. Is it not possible to get the initial data that converges to Schwarzschild by computing its ADM angular momentum? So Mihalis, you should unmute yourself in order to answer. So let me, I actually, I can unmute myself. Now, now I, I, yeah, we, we did oh, you have muted, so you can answer time, the question. Now, I think. Um, no, so unfortunately, the, the, the problem is that, okay, you can have whatever uh, ADM angular momentum you want. Um, angular momentum is conserved at, at spatial infinity, but not along null infinity. So in general, angular momentum radiates to, uh, to null infinity. So whatever your angular momentum is initially, 
in the sense of what, whatever its value is at, at let's say spatial infinity, that, that does not determine what it's going to be um, sort of at, let's call it at, at time-like infinity, that's to say, you know, the, the, the final you know, value. It's only in axis symmetry. So the vacuum equations under axis symmetry, they have the property that angular momentum cannot radiate to null infinity. And this is why in axis symmetry, okay, um, then you can, if, if, if you know that your initial data is axis symmetric and it's, let's say, ADM angular momentum is zero, you know that angular momentum cannot radiate to null infinity. So axis symmetry, of course, is preserved under evolution. So uh, the, if you have stability, the only thing this can possibly approach is Schwarz. So that's, uh, that's the difference. Thank you. I have one question. What about the real black holes? Do we know anything about their symmetries? So, um, so first of all, remarkably, real black holes, of course, real black holes, you know, they have a little bit of matter. Um, uh, in particular, they, and, and it's fortunate that they do, because otherwise, sort of, well, the only way we could, we could perceive them would be by uh, sort of uh, gravitational waves, like, okay, we have recently uh, supposedly done. But um, uh, for instance, galactic uh, black holes, the reason that we perceive them is that there is indeed visible matter um, uh, surrounding them. There are stars, there are sort of accretion disks, there are things like that. So there's a little bit of matter, but fortunately, or at least in the black holes that we can understand, uh, there is uh, little enough of it so that uh, thinking of these black holes as being vacuum Kerr solutions with sort of vacuum perturbations, so perturbed vacuum curve solutions, is actually a good uh, model in physics. So, uh, so in this sense, sort of this system, you know, the Einstein vacuum equations um, in a neighborhood of Kerr is actually uh, a relevant model in, in astronomy. Now, um, remarkably, um, there, uh, so remarkably, many of the black holes that have been inferred to, to to exist, their rotation parameter uh, is thought to be very near extremality. Now, I should say it's, it's observationally, it's relatively easy uh, to infer the mass parameter of a black hole if you, if you have, let's say, some star um, which, um, which orbits it then from, you know, Keplerian analysis, you can infer the, the, the mass of the central object. I mean, it's a Newtonian calculation, but it's basically correct in this context. It's much more difficult to try to infer the, the, the rotation parameters. So in some sense, there's a lot of debate on whether the inferences of rotation parameter uh, that are done observationally is correct. But nonetheless, if you believe what, what, what people say, then uh, many of the, the black holes are, are, are actually quite near uh, extremality. And so so it is um, important to, to understand what happens uh, at extremality because whatever happens at extremality in some regime, you'll see it near extremality. This is one of the reasons why there's such interest in the Aritakis instability that I, that I mentioned before. Okay, a question by, uh, from Ingo Havkin. A few words about what innovations allow to drop the polarized axisymmetric assumption it's not, I mean, as I, as I think I said, in, in some sense, um, by assuming that symmetry, there isn't so much gain. Um, so, you know, you, you, you work uh, with, a, with, a, with a, um, um, a simpler system, in some sense, just notationally simple. I mean, there are, there are simplifications like that, but there isn't, you know, there isn't so much um, uh, gain from, uh, from considering uh, somehow that, that symmetry per se. Yeah. Again, thank you very much.